Hi there, I'm Steve Levinson with Online Business Systems and here to talk about uh, PCI 4.0 as it has finally been released after at least two and a half years of anticipation. Um, over those two and a half years since we've been uh, privy to the draft versions of it, you know, my our QSA team of at least 30 QSAs and I have had hundreds of hours of dialogue about what this can mean to, to everybody out there in PCI land is uh, I believe there are a lot of profound changes. James? Yeah, absolutely, Steve. Uh, James DeVoy, um, four years ago, I think I sat down for the first time and, and discussed this with uh, members of the council. It's been a long time coming. You know, if, if we look at the history, you know, which we'll, we'll probably go into in a bit more detail, it's been, it's been over 10 years, I think, since, you know, we, 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 the last version was 2018, so four or five years ago. It, it's, a, it's a big change. There's lots going to happen here. So hopefully today we'll talk about that in more detail. And I think the PCI standard over the last 15-ish years has really evolved in a good way. Um, it's one of the few standards that has, for the most part, kept up with the times and also is detailed enough to really align with any sort of uh, security program. Um, you know, what we have often told our clients is that, um, you know, PCI compliance is the happy byproduct of a robust security program. And we'll see thematically in this version of the standard that there's going to be more and more things that touch on business as usual security, which is good. It means it will no longer be so tied up into a snapshot in time, but more along making sure that holistically speaking that, you know, folks are PCI compliant every day. If we just if we just go by the history of, of, of PCI, if you look back to, to where we've came from over those years, this one is, is a real fundamental change. There's a lot going to happen here. Um, you think about what's happened in that preceding time scale. You know, lots of people have moved to the cloud now. You know, we, we're moving all of our applications and all of our data out of, out of data centers. You know, the whole thing around segmentation is changing a lot. There's just so much happened. Then we, then we get hit by a pandemic on top of that. You know, the... the the world is a different place than it was four years ago when 3.2x was out. So I think there's going to be some, some big differences and big challenges to many organizations that, that will need to, to, to work our way along that road to get there. Which is what we're about to talk about here um, is we'll have uh, several of the folks from our team um, discuss some of these profound changes and uh, keeping in mind that you know the sooner you've all behind, the more time you're going to have to catch up to, to actually address these changes. And you know, one of the ones that, that I think is a, a large one will be around scoping. And as a lot of you guys know, you know, scoping is the bane of our collective existence in, in the PCI world, both from the CES entities as well as QSAs alike. It, it, it always takes so much effort to just get scoping down to, to being accurate. And, and also along those lines and some of the changes we'll talk to, um, making sure that you update your scoping on an ongoing basis. It doesn't become a, just a, a once a year type of exercise. So uh, Jeff Mann, we'll hand this to you to talk with uh, the rest of the folks from our team to start talking about some of these profound changes that are coming down the pipe. Thanks, Steve, uh, for the brief introduction. Uh, Jeff Mann, Senior Security Consultant here at Online. Um, and full disclosure, uh, a lot of us have worked together for, gosh, going on 15 years now. Uh, you know, we've had different uh, uh, signs in front of our storefront uh, over the years, but uh, a lot of us have been in, in doing this for a very long time. Before you guys get away, though, I actually have a couple questions for you just based on just the uh, you know, your initial reactions to what was promised was coming in, in version four by the council uh, and what we're seeing initially now that it's finally been published. You know, I, I think it was first announced back at the, the community meetings in 2019. We were together for North America in Vancouver. And, you know, one of the things that they said, the reasons why they're doing a, a full version revision, we're going, we're going from three, two to one to four was you know, the mention of the changes in technology and how, how, you know, our world is advanced and, you know, you've already mentioned a little bit of cloud migration and, you know, everything is, uh, you know, cloud-based and, and, and container-based and serverless and so on and so forth. Uh, initial reactions, uh, you know, to reading through the standard, do you, do you think they've uh, hit the mark on expectations of, 
uh, you know, migrating the standard to meet, you know, the, the, the current and emerging demands from a technology perspective? I would say maybe some of this lagged a little bit, and we'll use cloud technologies as an example, right? There's been folks out there, plenty, who have been using various um, forms of the cloud for 10 years, yet the standard still touched on things that were in your daddy's data center, you know, firewalls and switches and routers, oh my. So I think mm -hmm. with this version of the standard, it's at least catching things up to where existing technologies are. So I think in that sense, it's been a step in a good direction. Anything to add, James? Yeah, I think it's that whole, uh, the old image we see quite often, what is the cloud? Another guy's computer, you know, it's... Uh, it, it's certainly the way we're looking at now. Things like, you know, Azure AD, for instance, you know, looking at how that's now managed compared to an on-prem AD, you know, that, that brings new challenges for us as well. Um, looking at the, the the whole service provision now, more and more companies are outsourcing, you know, huge parts of the, their network. So the whole service provider provision is going to be, in my opinion, much more relevant now than it used to be. I think a lot of our clients are now outsourcing every aspect of their of their environment. You know, we've got all these new things like DevSecOps and you talked about containerized, you know, uh, programming. Uh, there's just an awful lot of things have changed. And I think it's about time, you know, although, although 2018 was the last version, it was really only an iterative approach even then. You know, we haven't had a major fundamental change like this since the beginning. So, I, I think it looks promising. You know, the, the, the proof will be in the pudding, basically. The proof will be there when we start using it and we actually are able to take it into a live environment. Um, I kind of expect a 4.x, you know, sometime in the near future. But I think that I think the version four is probably be here for another 10 years. I think it's I think it's I think it's that good, you know, in a lot of ways that we'll keep it for a while just with some small iterative changes. One of the main reasons we wanted to get together today and talk to some of our uh, more senior folks at our practice is to really walk through at a high level what we think are the biggest, most significant changes to the PCI standard in version 4.0, things that are going to impact us as assessors, but more importantly, things that are going to impact our, our clients. Uh, um, and we want to, we sort of talked collectively uh, in the months and years leading up to the release and, and came up with what we thought, uh, you know, based on all of our collective experiences, what are sort of our top 10 list. In no particular order, we want to just introduce those to you very quickly. The, the, the heart of it is 12 major requirements that are split up into hundreds of sub requirements and testing procedures. Uh, and there's introductory material that we sort of collectively call the preamble. Uh, and we noticed this uh, with version four, the preamble, and somebody joked in our practice that before you get to the 12 requirements, there's now 14 sections in the preamble. Sherry, can you uh, dig in on that a little bit and tell us about it? Yes, it's very interesting. They have become very definitive in their terms. So a lot of this is there have been so many questions about scope. What really is scope? Um, another example is encrypted data, card data. They address a lot of that in the start now in the preamble, helping you understand what really is considered in scope. They also have, which we'll talk about in a little bit, define things like significant change in this section. So they've, they've put in a lot of things to help us just kind of to give us a rule book to follow. And uh, helping us understand another big one in there is talking about how PADSS and the new secure software framework are working together. So it gives you a lot of very interesting information at the top of it. So it'll be, it's, it's just a lot of very valuable information for us to use. Yeah, it's interesting. My observation is that, um, you know, if, if you were to categorize what changes, you know, in any version change, there's always uh, retiring old requirements. There's certainly new requirements, and there's usually always a grace period before uh, entities, merchant service providers have to actually adhere to them. Uh, and there's also what's become a fairly significant category is what I would call the clarifications. And I think that's reflected in there's so much now more content uh, within uh, the preamble to the PCI data security standard. In my review on some of the specific topics, I've noted that 
uh, in some cases, they've simply taken language that they already have in existing FAQs up on the website and merely pulled it into the document. And I'm sure we all have uh, war stories about uh, you know, our, you know, creative discussions with clients over whether a requirement applies or how to interpret a particular requirement. And they've said something to the effect of, show me in the standard where it says I have to do that. Um, it seems like more and more, if this is a theme, the council has put everything they can think of, packed it into the standard uh, to try to give us as the QSAs a place to point to. You know, they've, they've added, there's now seven appendices to the standard. And one of the things that they've done is they've actually included the glossary now, I guess, because of so many concerns about what certain terms meant, they're now actually making that a part of your standard, which is, which is very new. So, uh, and also changing appendix A to B about share, instead of shared hosting providers now being multi-tenant, et cetera. So there are some interesting things that are now provided in the appendices as well. They're, you know, they're putting a whole lot more of the clarification detail in the PSS, in the DSS itself, rather than yeah. having all these extraneous places. Uh, you mentioned in the appendices, uh, especially in the new appendices, there's now this, this concept or this idea, which was advertised really back in 2019 at the community meeting as a big change. And that's this idea of a customized approach. Mark, can you briefly... Uh, you know, just tell us what is a customized approach and how does that differ from the existing compensating controls? So compensating controls is, is, as we've all known and loved over the years, is where an entity has a legitimate business or technical constraint and cannot implement the controls as, as tightly prescribed within the DSS. Um, the and that isn't changing. So again, that that is still going to continue on, and companies can still document compensating controls uh, for those particular areas. The customized approach, though, is is really intended for entities that are implementing innovative type of approaches to addressing a particular requirement, and it doesn't fit that round peg in the square hole. I like to say in terms of this particular, uh, and let's use antivirus as an example, because or anti-malware, because it, it's, it's one that we really have seen over the years that where this would fit perfectly is, is a lot of the new um, heuristic-based or you know, uh, anti-malware type of platforms that are not signature-based mm -hmm. uh, don't really fit into the testing procedures for five dot you know, whatever requirement it was, let's say periodic scan. Doesn't matter because the numbers have changed anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> periodic scanning, signature updates, you know, those types of things. Uh, it, it really, the only way we could document in the past was really a compensating control, which just touched on the surface of some of the aspects of how it was meeting intent. So customized approach is really going to cause uh, a, a few things to happen. The entity needs to really do that detailed risk analysis of What's the risk associated with not having the original control, as well as what is this technology that we're implementing to address what it's trying to accomplish? Is this meeting intent here? And then, you know, the the other side of the customized approach is just that the the testing of it is going to need to be designated and determined by the QSA company. So the QSA and the entity both have a lot more work on their plate to uh, do a customized approach. It, it is going to be available for, for just about every requirement in the standard, um, but we uh, are imagining that you know it, it really will be applied <clears throat> lightly, I would think, to start for most companies. Another change that's coming in version four of the standard, which seems a little bit uh, of a uh, an attempt by the council to try to get companies away from sort of the checkbox mentality uh, is that they've pulled out what used to be just a, a requirement that showed up mostly in requirement 12. And that has to do with roles and responsibilities. So now at the beginning of each of the first 11 requirements, there's a it's verbatim in each requirement, the numbers change per requirement, but a statement that says roles and responsibilities for performing activities in requirement X are documented, assigned, and understood. 
Uh, Mark, you have some thoughts on this one? I do. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And you're, you're right on there with, uh, you know, covering it in requirement 12 and the under 321. It was more of a attestation, you know, for, for the majority of these by the QSA that at the end of the assessment, they had really gotten the interviewing done at, throughout the assessment to confirm these roles and responsibilities were assigned. Uh, yeah, and, and when we look at the comparison between uh, 321 and 4.0, uh, another area where it was really covered already in, in 321 was the roles and responsibilities for management of network uh, devices and firewalls up in requirement one. As you said, the rest of those are all, all new in between. And when we deep dive into those requirements, it's, it's pretty much the same call out on each. Um, but I, I did think it was interesting that uh, of the 68 new requirements in the 4.0, uh, there was the majority of those are, are, are not going to be required until that March uh, 2025 timeframe. Of the 13 that are effective immediately, 10 of those are for these roles and responsibilities. So it, it's, it's definitely something that uh, the council, and I think in general, as, as we look at it too, we think that this is something that's pretty tackleable for most companies, although larger companies, this could be a significant uh, impact at least to get it off the ground and document it if they haven't done a good job of it so far. Um, but as, as we look down through those, um, you know, another interesting uh, side note is that it's going to be your 1.1.2 uh, and 2.1.2 all the way down through the standard through 11. And every, everywhere we see that, it's going to be roles and responsibilities requirements. Yeah, I really think it's interesting that uh, it's one of those types of requirements that come with a new release that it's like, okay, they put it in this, you know, revision, it was important enough to add, it's because they must have thought or the organizations weren't meeting the spirit of whatever the pre existing requirements were. And certainly with, uh, you know, the fact that there's so many processes and procedures that are supposed to be in place. Uh, you would think that people would know that they're supposed to do them. Uh, the fact that they have to make this explicit, uh, I think, is interesting. I wonder, and, and Jordan, I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments on this. I wonder what the impact of so many companies that try to automate as much as possible uh, all the things, uh, how they're, how they're going to react to, the, to, to this, this new requirement that's effective immediately. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Jeff. And I think, you know, that there's kind of two layers to it. And the first is for tooling automation in terms of implemented controls and that kind of stuff, it's probably not going to impact what they're doing too much beyond some descriptive kind of stuff, because these designing resources and responsibilities doesn't isn't necessarily something you gather automated evidence for, right? But for those folks that rely on automation for compliance management, their GRC systems, as we touched on um, uh, earlier, um, those systems that, that rely on linking, you know, individual requirement numbers to who's responsible for evidence and that kind of stuff, all those are going to have to get updated and changed now because, because these new requirements are different and you have that, that definite role and responsibility assignment. And in fact, it's not just that role and responsibility change that's going to affect that. In addition to, you know, like you said, with, with getting away from checkbox auditing, in addition to moving or, or creating that new second requirement in, in each of the main requirements for assigning roles and responsibilities, they also moved the established documentation for policy procedures needed to implement the controls in each requirement. They moved that from the last of each requirement up to the very beginning. That's the number one that's in front of these new number twos. So right away, you have an assumption or the expression that every company out there, every organization that's establishing or, or, or maintaining PCI compliance has to start from a program management approach. Have your documentation on your policies requiring everything, have your procedures for doing them, assign responsibility for carrying that stuff out to somebody, and then start looking at the controls themselves. Right. Yeah, I think that, and that, you know, tying in the documentation and the, the policies and procedures associated, it, it, this requirement and the way it's been implemented reminds me back with 3.2, where that was the added to the standard, the, what used to be the 1.5 or the dot fives, and having the, you know, folks that were working with the, through the assessment with acknowledge that they understand and have read all those policy procedure standards. 
So this this does seem like the next logical step. One other thing. Of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, sure. There's there's one other thing about this. You know, we never had a hard time doing new employees are doing terminated employees. What we've always had a tough time doing is moves, ads, and changes. And this is kind of the same thing with having these roles and responsibilities documented. It actually gives an organization uh, kind of the key that you've got to do these things. And it doesn't matter if Sam doing this role is now reporting to a different person, a different team, or whether a new manager comes in. It's, it is in writing that those functions must be performed regardless. And I think that that might help with some of the, uh, the changes that we've seen where employees end up moving to different departments or new management comes in or somebody gets moved and, and things fall on the floor. I'm hopeful that this will help with that challenge. Yeah, and, and as, as we sit back and look at how can companies implement this, it's really going to depend on the complexity and the size. Uh, and one of the common questions that we're already getting is, uh, does it need to be the names of the people that are performing these roles in whatever documentation? And it's just, you know, our, our standard answer for that is it's, it's going to be better to list roles um, or teams and roles and groups as opposed to specific individuals. And when we look at larger entities, uh, uh, I think really that racy type of matrix is, is most likely going to be the way that they can get there. <laughs> Although it could be, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to do this, but uh, some type of, you know, uh, matrix of who's responsible, what is their role, have they been, you know, have they acknowledged it, um, and do they understand what, what, what it is that falls under that uh, category. Yeah, and in, in effect, Mark, I, I would also say that that need to create that racy style matrix of responsibility, accountability, um, I forgot what the C stands for. <laughs> and, and insulted, needs, uh, apparently. Insulted and informed, <laughs> right, right. Who needs, to, who needs to know and have input in, into the processes? Um, you mentioned before that, that this might be a bigger impact at large companies because a lot of smaller companies, you know, at the end of the day, their, their security compliance may fall to a single individual. But I think the need to document that responsibilities will help some of those folks in those smaller organizations identify that they can't own everything. And this is how they can document who needs to own those things that, that isn't, doesn't fall within their, their you know, ability or, or realm of management. You know, there are, you know, in retail spaces, for example, there's front end managers that deal with, you know, the cashiers at the cash registers and stuff, and, and they're going to be responsible for implementation of some of those processes. Now, that's, that's a well-known thing in the PCI space for anybody that's got, you know, point of interaction devices to inspect, but it's just an example of the fact that even in those organizations, it can't fall on one guy's shoulders or one person's shoulders. And this is one of the ways that, that those compliance folks and those security folks can help get other people to, you know, help her out with getting things done. Yeah. That's yeah, a really good point, Jordan. Sorry. I think my take on this is, and looking at the, the whole history of the, the data security standard, uh, you know, going back all the way to version one, it, I think it was understood, or at least I understood as a QSA, that, uh, you know, there's responsibility in an organization to do all the security things that PCI is looking for you to do. In version two, uh, it was tacked on at the end of uh, 12, I think it was there in version one and two, you know, one of the requirements buried in in requirement 12 was, you know, make sure all this is written down and there's roles and responsibilities assigned. Version three comes along and they push this to the last requirement in, in one through 11, you know, telling me, okay, people weren't getting it. They weren't really following that one requirement. And then this is the ultimate. They're splitting it out uh, separately uh, and, 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 and also pushing it up front. To me, it's almost the it seems like it's a, almost like a last ditch effort to try to uh, preserve what was the original intent of the whole PCI compliance experience where you have the, the QSA as the security expert that's advising and consulting and trying to provide subjective, if you will, interpretation of how well you're meeting the requirements. And, you know, an argument could be made that, uh, you know, where this used to be just, you know, more or less in one spot in requirement 12, uh, it should either be a non-issue that it's broken out and separated into the 11 requirements that all these things are assigned and understood. Uh, and if it's not, <laughs> it kind of tells you that, 
you really weren't doing this the right way previously. So it's, I can almost see this as a catch 22 for organizations. If they balk about it, they're kind of sh showing their hand uh, that they really weren't doing it. Uh, I think correctly in the first place. Yeah. And, it, you know, when we look at this, it, as you, as you mentioned, is it was really that they did understand their roles and responsibilities, but they may not have necessarily been documented in detail. And that is what this this is filling in that that blank for. And yep. uh, some, you know, the documentation, sometimes we think of that as, a, you know, that's what's the big deal. It's just creating another document. But it, it can be a lot of work for some companies out there. Uh, they're going to be wanting to get a head start on this so that it's ready to go day one of their 4.0 assessment. Right. And one of the things that a lot of, of assessed entities, you know, who weren't who weren't themselves steeped in the DSS may have missed a lot of the discussion in the 3.2.1 standard about integrating PCI compliance into your business as usual processes. And to your point, Jeff, about making sure people are really aware of what they need to do now, I think this is a step towards that direction, making sure that organizations recognize this isn't a once a year thing. This isn't a, yeah, this isn't a, a, uh, you know, just purely compliance thing. This is something that everybody needs to own and, and handle the pieces they're responsible for. One of the other things that is a significant change, but initially we thought probably mostly just to QSAs, uh, but upon further reflection, we're realizing, you know, this could really significantly impact our customers as well. And that's simply revolving around the notion that uh, within the PCI standard itself, virtually all of the requirements uh, have been renumbered because they added new things to each of the uh, 12 major sections. So requirements that we've known for years and years as a certain requirement number, it's now different. It's, it's ticked up one or two, depending on, on the requirement. James, uh, any thoughts on this uh, implications and what, what it all means? Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. Um... Some people may look upon this as a minor, you know, change. It's, it's only a renumbering. And if you think of that carefully, you know, I've had a couple of conversations recently with clients as we were expecting a renumbering. We were certainly expecting um, different numbers, additional numbers. So we always knew before we got sight of the uh, of the new version that there would be some relevance to numbering. Um, you know, we've just we've just had the standard released and. You know, I'm thinking of the impact upon even clients who are using tools, for instance, you know, client, forget you guys as QSAs, the QSAs really understand all the numbers, you all remember them all, you've all got some kind of weird brain that remembers each of these, you know, requirements and can rattle them off in conversations. Um, but think about the clients who have GRC tools. Um, I've had a couple of conversations in the previous months with clients that are really worried about how they're going to have to, to redesign their, their actual tool sets. They're going to have to renumber those tool sets. They're going to have to, 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 to change their dashboards and, the, and, the, and their, their KPIs um, to align with the new version of the standard. And it made me think, and I, and I spoke to a couple of the vendors that we, we, we know some of those vendors. We actually you know, partner with a couple of them. And, and we spoke to, I spoke to those vendors and said, what do you feel when this new standard does arrive? This was obviously a few weeks ago. When it does arrive, what do you think this is going to do to you? And they're extremely concerned. They are basically saying that they, they've not had sight of the standard they, uh, until now, it's just been released. Um, what they are saying is that we, it's not just PCI. We actually map the standards against other standards. So they map them against COVID, they map them against ISO, they map them against NIST. You know, that's a big job. That's a big job redesigning all those mappings again. Um, and then they talked to me about the data sets behind the scene. You know, the data sets are going to be sitting there and they'll have to be moved. The, the data is going to have to be lifted and shifted possibly in some cases. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff going on in the background there. I think there will be, you know, a, a cost to organizations to retool or to, you know, to re bring consultants back in to redesign some of these, these tool sets. You know, we've, we've, we've seen every, you know, in, in all the years we've been doing this, we've seen, you know, pretty cost effective tools, but we've seen some of the big brand tools from the big clients that cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, that, that, that's that's a, an interesting thing for, pe for people to, to consider. I have a couple clients and you know who you are. 
I know you know who you are. It's not just our QSAs that have warped brains that remember those numbers. I actually have a few clients who can sit there and say, yeah, well, you remember that in, in requirement 8.3.1. So we, it's not just us. It's actually some of our clients too that have been doing this for so long. So their brain damage is also going to have to be fixed to uh, come into alignment with V4O. We've talked about how some of the changes uh, that we think are significant are really, uh, in essence, clarifications. And uh, I, I want to say briefly, and I think all of us would agree, when we say this significant change, we don't always necessarily mean it's a change for the bad. You know, hopefully the council intended all these changes for the good. And certainly clarifications are meant to just help make the whole process easier by sort of removing the opportunities for doubt or removing the, the wiggle room that a lot of us QSAs are very often frustrated by. Um, one of those changes has to do with changing the way uh, certain requirements talk about uh, the time periods. Greg Crafts, uh, part of our EMEA practice, principal consultant. Greg, what are your thoughts on, uh, on some of these changes in terms of time periods? Thanks very much, Jeff. Yeah, so uh, in terms of, of, of timelines, uh, it seems the council has, has bedded down on the principle of establishing clarification for exactly all of the various timelines that are involved throughout the standard. Uh, some of the verbiage in the preamble, which is quite, uh, quite pertinent, is, is that they want people to be as close to those timelines without exceeding them. So that kind of clarification has been given specifically in relation to guidance to things like when, when testing should be performed, all of those cadences that are involved in your business as usual process now fall under a very specific set of guidance. So the daily, the weekly, the monthly, all of those are, are very specifically called out in the amount of days that they should be or the nth day of the month. So that clarification has given us that ability to now you know, put, put an end to, to, to some of those slippages in, in that and when there's some misinterpretation of those standards where people kind of, you know, you know, a month could be any time of the month and any time of the next month and there's a big pause in between. It's trying to avoid those, those instances where we have, a, we have a gap in that, that ongoing business as usual process that's, that's been pushed so hard. Uh, you know, there's a very good call out on some of the specific requirements within those, those timelines that, that get a bit of a better definition, significant changes incorporated into a time frame element within the, within the standard. So there's a, a bit of guidance that's coming a bit later on that, um, you know, promptly has that been defined now. So the, the definition of promptly is as soon as it's reasonably possible. Uh, the, the principle of periodic has also changed. And we're going to discuss that a little bit further as well, because it, it, it relates to, to some additional uh, elements that will be need to be taken care of when you encompass a periodic uh, check of a, of a control. Uh, so those elements are definitely uh, being clarified and they're definitely being given some, some attention so that we, we don't uh, slip on any of those requirements. Yeah, you touched really on, on on two of the items that I immediately thought of when we talked about the the changing in, in terms of the the wording or the definition of of anything related to time in the standard. And, and as you said, uh, there's certain requirements that they give you the time frame, and they've tried to nail down. Yeah, we really do mean this block of time. Uh, the other one you mentioned is you know there's always that that clause or after a significant change. Uh, can you just briefly define or describe what they're talking about or how they've defined significant change to make our lives so much easier moving forward? Absolutely. So in, in terms of you know, looking, looking at some of the elements within a significant change that, that you know, previously were considered, we, we were looking at the, the, the significant uplift of tin you know, we were looking at that, you know, maybe, you know, a, a specific change in, in a, a payment platform, you know, something that really affected the business operations of an organization. That definition has been expanded quite a bit now. You know, we're looking at new, new hardware and software. We're looking at the replacement or upgrades of hardware or software. And we're even looking at the change in storage and the flow of information to affect a significant change. One of those that really kind of, you know, uh, buttons this down for me is that if there's any change in the vendors or service providers, it's also considered a significant change and also a change to the actual organizational structure. 
So consider a scenario where you would have an organization that's acquiring additional organizations. So they might be consuming some of the market competitors to buy uh, you know, market space. Uh, they'll have to undergo a significant change and continue to ensure that the entire environment is, is assured of being secured. So another change in terms of the time definition is there are certain requirements that say, make sure you do things periodically but darned if they never defined what periodically meant. Uh, but now they have come up with uh, sort of different rules or, or a different framework in terms of those requirements to talk about periodically. So what are they saying now about the periodicity of certain requirements? Well, periodically uh, for me, is quite an interesting one because it's, it's, uh, there's some additional requirements that come around periodic changes that has not really been considered historically. Now, one of those principles being is, is that anything defined within a periodic change or a periodic cadence that gets undertaken must be defined within your risk analysis, right? And, and this risk analysis principle is taking hold throughout the entire standard. You know, there's over 80 references to risk analysis throughout the standard. And uh, that is going to mean that when a, when a customer has the ability to define a specific period or timeline in which they're performing an action, it must be documented. You know, and they need to be following that documented process. And that's been uh, given the, the proper assurance by their risk team to, to assure that they're doing the right thing. We've talked uh, a few times already in our discussion about this concept of scope. And certainly scope is a major effort that's supposed to be uh, validated and, and, and performed by the entity being assessed, whether it's a merchant or service provider. Um, one of our uh, uh, more tedious members of the group actually uh, counted, which I think you can do in Word if you highlight a, a word, but you know, found that there's uh, 160 references in scope now in version four. Steve, can you tell us briefly why scope is such a big deal and, and why, uh, you know, if not if nothing else, adding the word so many times into the PCI standard in version four is significant? Sure thing. And scope has always been the bane of our collective existence because um, it's, it's really hard to define exactly what is in scope, right? You have your, your tier one systems that are the systems that store, process, and handle cardholder data. But then all those tier two systems, which are the attached systems, right? And, and a lot of our clients uh, and QSAs alike have struggled to define, well, exactly what does that mean? Because you may have an attached system that has no potential security impact. So it's in scope, but maybe it doesn't matter quite as much as the ones that are attached, such as authentication servers that certainly have a potential impact. So part of this exercise is not just during the, the assessment itself where you go through scoping, but really it's now gonna be an ongoing thing to build in business as usual so that everybody out there in PCI land is keeping is their ears close to the track as possible to be able to understand the, the what their scope should be and, and know how to better and, and proactively manage it. It'll be interesting to me how the, the whole addition additional detail to scope or at least reference to scope plays out, especially when it comes to uh, the application of self-assessment questionnaires, which is becoming more and more of a common practice, using them as templates or overlays to try to help merchants in particular who have you know, taken steps to reduce their footprint significantly, uh, you know, attempt to sort of use the, the short forms of, of the SAQs to highlight the requirements that they still need to respond to. James, you had a thought on this? Yeah, I think it ties in as well with Greg's previous conversation. Um, sadly, I've seen it, and I'm sure we've all seen it in our, in our, in our QSA careers, where, where customers will either try and hide things from the assessor, um, or they'll... I actually have a genuine client about five or six years ago, probably more than that now, who actually turned off a whole bunch of servers when I arrived at the uh, to do the assessment. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, we've decommissioned them. I knew they hadn't decommissioned them, 
but I, I can't call them a liar. I've got to say to them, yeah, okay, they're not, they're not in scope any longer, knowing that they're going to turn them back on again the minute I leave the environment. And they did that because they were connected to systems. They did that because they didn't want them in scope because they couldn't, because they were running applications and they were running various services that were non-patched, that were out of date, et cetera. So, you know, this moving towards you know, a, a BAU continuous assessment type model that's looking at expanding the scope into to attached business units as well and all the other things that we're talking about. I think the, the, the council has has really tried to address some of those issues that we saw uh, over the past decade or so. As someone that's been in the information security business for 40 years now, and I've been doing PCI related work for almost 20 years, uh, my gravest concern is the way scope has become, uh, as Steve mentioned, it's been, always been the bane of our existence, but it, it's, it now seems to be more all we talk about. And, and I personally am frustrated that so many clients, all they want to do is talk about scope reduction rather than what to me is practicing the basic security best practices that are really what is the essence of the PCI data security standard. Uh, I, I would go so far as to say that scope production activities, that's not a security discussion, uh, but you know, take that for what it is. Uh, one of the other changes that has uh, shown up in, in PCI version four that we think is interesting, if not significant, is, and I think it again falls into the category of clarification, and that's the notion that there's now, and we didn't even notice it at first, but you know, we spotted it when this thing first dropped, there's now a, a subtle change or an additional term that we need to get used to, and that is the, 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 the rule of thumb has always been, you know, going back to the scope discussion, is there cardholder data involved? Is there a primary account number data involved? There's now a new term that's called account data. Um, Jordan Wiseman, a uh, fellow consultant at Online Business Systems, can you talk to us briefly about what this new term is all about and what you think they're trying to accomplish and, and why we think it's perhaps a significant change? Um so one of the reasons that we didn't notice this at first is that the standard has always defined account data as, you know, there's a table in the, in the, in the old version of the standard that talked about account data, and it has two columns, cardholder data, that's CHD, um, which is the account number itself, cardholder's name, the expiration date, and the service code, which is something embedded usually in, in kind of details you don't see on the card itself. Um, and then they define sensitive authentication data separately as full track data, so everything in the magnetic stripe, um, the card verification codes, that three digit code you get asked for on the back and then pin numbers and, and how pin numbers are, are, are transmitted. Um, but most of the, the actual requirements in the standard either referenced CHD only or said CHD or sensitive authentication data. And there were a handful of requirements that just applied to that, that sensitive authentication data itself. And so that led to a lot of confusion around, does this requirement apply to cardholder data? Does this requirement apply to just sensitive authentication data? Um, does, is sensitive authentication data itself actually also cardholder data? You know, a classic example of this is in what used to be um, well, well, in requirement three, where there was talking about the fact that if you store cardholder data, you have to encrypt it. Well, part of the problem with that requirement is that it, reply, is that it applied to cardholder data. So that led to actual legitimate questions around, does this also apply to sensitive authentication data if you in fact have a legitimate need to store that other than you know like card issuers and that kind of stuff. So now the council has actually kind of gone back to hey we've defined this separately before but they've gone through the standard to update most of the requirements to a clarify when they talk about what this control should apply to it applies to account data so that means both cardholder data and sensitive authentication data. And they've done that many times. I mean, the references to account data, you know, just going back to like counting occurrences in the standard in, in, in 321, you know, in, in the old days, it, the phrase account data was used maybe a handful of times. In the new one where they've updated all those requirements, it's there over a hundred times now. The other place besides requirement three and all the places with throughout the body of the rock where it talks about, you know, what do you do if it's account data? We ought to encrypt it or whatnot. But the other side of that discussion is around the scoping. 
So we have so many clients that, you know, in, in this day and age of tokenization, where they may just have sensitive authentication data being transmitted or processed on their network. And again, there's no room for argument in that conversation. Now, those, those systems are processing account data. And even though they don't have the PAN, they are in scope and part of the CDE. So yep. just another, another point to keep in mind. Account data is really what we need to relearn as QSAs, I think, and 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 of course our, our clients will learn this over time. It, it's it's really the litmus test is yep. account data, and it's meant to be inclusive. Never say that the council and PCI is not inclusive. Sorry, that, that's really really yep. important also for those discussions on scope that we mentioned before, because now scope historically we've always talked about you know your cardholder data environment and the systems that connect to it or that impacted security. Well, now so many of the controls apply and we're specifically referring to account data. You need to think about that, that's you know, changing that scope a little bit. So you have an account data environment. I mean, they still call it a CDE, but the idea really is that um, all of that data needs to be protected. And that implies to those scoping discussions that, that you'll have to be having on a regular basis. Right. So an industry change that uh, got picked up by the PCI standard in version four, and this, you know, I'm sure they knew it was coming, but it, it, it came uh, about somewhere during the, the draft process, was the fact that the industry itself, a lot of the card brands are revising what they call the bin number, the bank identification number. Historically, it's been up to six digits, and now in some cases it's going to eight digits. And of course, the standard has to address that somehow. And, and uh, Jordan, I want to go back to you and ask you, you know, how is the fact that there's now eight digit bins out there impacting the PCI standard and give us some examples of, of where it's impactful? Sure. Yeah. So this is an interesting um, item to point out in, in that it's an industry change. It's not directly related to changes in the PCI standard, although this new standard, as you can see, if you go down to what is now requirement 341, um, the council, you know, they, they've clarified the requirement to you used to be first six, last four. That was the mantra everybody remembered. You can, you know, if you're displaying cartilage data, the safe parts are the first six and last four, which was that bank identifier, the first six. And then the last four of the account number were considered, which is the last three of the account number plus a tech, check digit actually were designed to allow for uniquely identifying numbers without disclosing, you know, what the actual account number was. Well, this switch to eight digit bins has led to updated guidance from all of the card brands, as well as from the council on, on now how you can display more effectively of what is the entire you know, pan, including the bin and, and the last four, um, but how to do that effectively. The, the, the actual control, instead of saying first, li li first six, last four, now says that you can display the, um, the, the bin and the last, um, Sorry, hold on. Let me let me it's read that bin, again. It's the bin in the last four. Well, it says last four are the maximum number of digits to be displayed, um, right. which is interesting because that's different than the guidance that the council themselves released, which is first eight, you know, <laughs> any, any, any four. So, yeah. Which is why we're talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> this is going to be confusing. Yeah, yeah, Jordan, just to add in something there for you as well, just as a, as a note, I mean, the, the bigger problem that, that sits in this big smorgasbord of mess is the, the the fact that the the processor and or the merchant doesn't really have much of a choice it's going to be an acquirer decision because the actual rolling up of those transactions is going to need to meet some kind of a schema that's that's met yeah. universally now it's, it's going to be a challenge you know not only for for the vendors but for because the vendors will have to support multiple schemas by multiple acquirers so it's really it's a technical nightmare yep I think it's okay. also worth pointing out, although it's borderline probably getting into the weeds, but the standard now distinguishes between the displaying and masking of the card number versus what can be stored and what qualifies as adequate truncation. And the truncation still sort of reverts back to the, which was never specified in the previous versions, first six, last four, as sort of the minimum qualifying adequate truncation. So you can display eight you can't store eight 
So if you've been uh, counting on your fingers and toes as we've been going through this discussion, you know we've probably exceeded top 10. We do have a bonus round, though, something that's near and dear to me because I'm a, a former uh, product marketing major for one of the major scan vendors uh, who shall remain nameless. Uh, there is a new requirement, a, a new change to existing requirements in terms of vulnerability scanning. Jordan, I wonder if you could uh, enlighten us on to what the change is and, and, and what we think the impact is going to be to our clients. Sure. So this is a future dated requirement, which there's a number of them in the new standard that, that you have about three years, maybe a little less than to, to get done. They take effect March 31st, 2025. But going forward for internal vulnerability scans, those scans are going to have to be authenticated scans, which is something new that most folks haven't dealt before. This is significant in that, yes, anybody who's been on the system admin side of the table, as I, I was in a prior life, setting up the authenticated scans, making sure that the scanners can actually connect to, authenticate to, and, and log in to all of the systems out there, that, that's not an insignificant amount of work just to get that running in the first place. Um, the second thing this is going to do is it's going to change the perspective you get from vulnerability scanning. So primarily and most probably, and, and this is something that'll, that'll flesh out over time as we all deal with this to kind of see what the output is, but one of the big changes it's going to make is there's probably going to be a lot more false positives that have to be dealt with. Um, you know, currently with even unauthenticated scans, one of the interesting um, kind of recurring themes that people see has to do with discovering the, an SSH um, system running on the box. Um, Open SSH has three vulnerabilities that have to do with information disclosure that the, the, the group behind OpenSSH says they're not going to fix because it's, it's not really necessarily a security problem. Specifically, you can you know, enumerate user accounts on the box if you really want to figure out you know, who lives there. Well, this is something that comes up all the time as kind of a recurring you know, false positive, and it comes up because vulnerability scanners just see that SSH is there because they can connect to it on port you know, 22 or, or sometimes on, on other ports. Um, with authenticated scanning, where the scanner is going to be able to actually connect to the box and do much deeper inventories of installed software and stuff, there's probably going to be a lot more of these kind of, hey, you're running, you know, this version of Nginx. Hey, I found this, this, you know, locally installed jQuery library and as opposed to, you know, linking from, from you know, the cloud or something. And, and so that's going to generate a lot more of these, hey, you're running this potentially vulnerable thing on the box, deal with it, even without necessarily the scanner being able to validate that the version that's on your box is in fact vulnerable in the first place. You know, some of the um, uh, operating system and, and software package vendors out there will sometimes include updates to software packages they release as part of their repositories, but they won't change the version number of the software itself. It's called backporting patches. Um, and not all the phone scanners will will recognize that that you know hey that's actually not vulnerable to that they'll just see that you have a version of the software installed and and say you you've got a problem, so it's going to make at least on that first pass and probably for a, a little while those conversations between the security and vulnerability management folks and the system admin folks um, take a little bit longer be a lot more complicated and there'll be more maybe probably back and forth discussions with with auditors too and this for what it's worth um, isn't just a PCI potentially thing. A lot of other security standards, if not require, at least at least part of the control set there has to do with vulnerability scanning. Well, if now you're doing that authenticated fashion, it's it's going to change the nature of the discussions that, that you have and the results that you see from those scans. Another one of the significant changes that we want to note or highlight here is the fact that the, there are now uh, a whole lot of new, uh, a, a long list of appendices uh, at, the, at the end of the PCI data security standard. Mark Hanna, uh, principal consultant at Online, uh, can you give us a little bit of a, a primer on what to expect in these new, all, the whole set of appendices and, and why, why we think it's significant? So in regards to the appendices, Jeff, yes, they're at the end of the standard. Um, there are some new ones. There's some old tried and true ones uh, that did not really change significantly. A couple of the new ones that, that are there that provide a lot of good detailed information is in uh, Appendix A, which is a big change, uh, changing from shared hosting providers to uh, really specific guidance on assessing multi-tenant service providers. Appendix D, is the um, customized approach. And uh, Appendix E is a, a guideline for performing a targeted risk assessment. Um, Appendix F, also new. 
um, which is uh, support and leveraging the PCI software security framework. Uh, and then one that we all felt was really nice to include as part of the standard is the glossary. It's no longer a separate uh, separate document. It's, it's Appendix G for glossary right down there in the standard. Yeah, I think if the council is going to get uh, gold stars for anything, it's that they, they've uh, it, it succeeded at putting everything as much as possible in one document. Of course, it makes it a very large document, but uh, you know, no longer hopefully can entities uh, claim, well, we didn't know that. We didn't realize that because it's kind of all there in front of you. So I want to thank everybody, uh, all of my colleagues that have participated in this discussion today. We really intended this to just be a, a kind of a, a first pass initial reaction, uh, you know, because our collective brain trust has been looking at this for so long and, and we've been eager to talk about it for two years. Um, we are planning as, as a practice to release more information in, in the weeks and months to come. So stay tuned on our, our website and our blog site. We're gonna do some drill downs on a lot of the topics we've talked about today and, and probably have a few more that we haven't talked about. Things that didn't make necessarily the top 10 list, but things that we still think are impactful and are gonna take some time to sort out. Of course, there is that caveat that most of these things that are new and change, there's a grace period. Some are shorter than others. Um, and and one thing we didn't touch on, but you know, there are new service provider only requirements as well as the existing ones. And there's some short time suspense uh, buy-in grace periods for those as well. So stay tuned. Uh, we hope we, you have found this to be informative and helpful. If it's sparked questions, if you wanna talk about it more, of course, feel free to reach out to our practice or any one of us individually. We're, we're, as you can see, we're more than happy to talk about these things. Thanks a lot.